Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dr. Bhanu Priya Rohila from the Department of English, Mohanlal Sukharia University, Udaipur. And today, in this class, we are going to discuss two poems back to back. The first one is Holy Thursday, and the second one is London. Both the poems are composed by William Blake. And here I wish to remind you all that we have already covered the first unit of the syllabus that I have chosen for this program. That is uh, British Romantic Literature for Undergraduates as per this UGC CBCS syllabus. And these poems are a part of the second unit. The remaining parts of the unit 2 will be discussed in the next lecture. So without wasting much time, let us begin with the topic here. Before we discuss the texts, let us get familiar with the poet William Blake, who we have already discussed very briefly as a pre-romantic poet in the last lecture. So let us first discuss him in detail here. William Blake William Blake was born in London in 1757. He was a visionary, a poet and an artist. He was trained as a painter and printmaker. He started painting at the age of 10 and at the age of 14 he became an apprentice to an engraver for seven years, which means he continued to be so till the age of 21. Later, he continued to work professionally as illustrator, illuminator and engraver for books and journals for living throughout his life. His interest in Gothic art is quite apparent in his uh, artistic works. His parents were dissenters and therefore he was also very religious or some even prefer to call him spiritual. He did not receive much of formal education and was primarily educated by uh, his parents at home, especially by his mother. His childhood was peaceful. But what makes it interesting are the mystic visions he used to see. It is said that he saw visions of gods, angels and ghosts from a very early age as he himself had claimed to have seen them. This continued throughout his life. He talked about them as casually as we would discuss about the trivial things. His visions had a deep impact on his poetry and his craftsmanship as an engraver too. 
the pictures of angels and gods were quite commonplace in his drawings. Now, if we discuss him as a poet, we know that he was an early romantic writer or a pre-romantic writer. So though his poetic works were not regarded meritorious during his lifetime uh, and uh, mostly he was uh, neglected. He was very much neglected as some even called him insane for his mysterious and uh, unreal talks and his claims of seeing visions. But the later poets were quite influenced by his writings as they found him uh, an original writer. His poetry was uh, never published in an ordinary way or in a very conventional way. Rather, they came out as commentaries to his own artworks and his engravings. Blake's poetry was different from the 18th century writers or uh, what we call uh, the new neoclassical writers both in manner and matter. His visions gave way to his imagination and he repudiated logic and science. His writings were full of symbolism. His prophetic visions made him look eccentric, but his poetry was very simple and musical. And uh, it was not showing any complexities or any difficulties to understand. The revolutions of the time affected the writers and the artists the most. And Blake, who was both a writer and an artist, was greatly impacted and his reactions to the massive changes that took place in England that time can be mapped in his writings very easily and also in his engravings also uh, they can be seen. Though late in time but his artistic excellence and his poetic skills made him a significant writer of the pre-romantic era. Although he was highly influenced by Milton, but his religious or prophetic poems did not follow Milton in manner, as he did not use the blank verse which Milton uh, had used. But he wrote uh, in his own different style. As an engraver, he was very famous for his method of etching and he himself had engraved and illuminated many of his poems using this method. Probably this is uh, something that makes him very different from the other poets or his contemporaries. Now let's see his literary works. At the age of 26, he came up with a poetic volume titled Poetical Sketches in 1783. It was a collection of prose and poetry. But his most significant contribution to literature was in form of uh, the two poetry volumes. The first one was Songs of Innocence, which came out in 1789, and the other collection of poetry came in 1794, titled as Songs of Experience. The first one, the first collection, had 19 poems in it, and the latter one had 26 poems. The books were based on Milton's mythical dualism. The words innocence and experience contradict each other and thus 
reflect the contrasting moods the volume songs of innocence deals with the themes of tenderness of human emotions trust on human kind love god and christianity whereas the songs of experience reflects disillusionment and disgust with society and human beings and their tyranny in general so the two volumes reflect the fallen and the unfallen worlds where they have happy or joyous moods and on the other hand have the bitter experiences of life the songs of innocence has poems like the shepherd the lamb the chimney sweeper the little boy lost the little boy found the divine image holy thursday night spring etc and the other collection that is songs of experience has poems like the clod and the pebble holy thursday the little girl lost the little girl found a dream the tiger the garden of love london a poison tree the school boy etc in them many of these students must have read in their schools as well the next in line is marriage of heaven and hell this came out in 1793 it was a series of biblical prophecies the work seems to be influenced by milton and dante here blake gives his theory of contraries and talks about the significance of perception among the other famous works poems like jerusalem which came out in 1832 the book of thel which came out in 1793 the first book of urizen uh, which came out in uh, 1818 and in 1810 he wrote milton uh, are very famous poems so this was all about the poet william blake and his famous works and now let us begin with the first poem in hand that is holy thursday the poem holy thursday by william blake was first printed in the collection songs of innocence in 1789 it is to be noted here that there is another poem with the same title in the collection songs of experience which came out in 1794 by the same poet william blake but that is different here we can see the illuminated text of the poem by blake himself so before we begin with the text let us get familiar with the title of the poem that is holy thursday here blake uses a special occasion in the christian calendar which is celebrated as the ascension day the ascension day is celebrated on the 40th day of easter according to the christian belief on easter jesus uh, resurrected after his crucifixion on good friday so this thursday this holy thursday is different from the monday thursday which is popularly known as holy thursday which takes place before easter but in this context the holy thursday 
is different which is the ascension day that commemorates the ascension or the physical departure or the rising of the body of christ into heaven so this is different from the one that takes place before easter in england the day is mostly celebrated by observing feasts in this poem blake describes the special church service annually observed on this occasion of holy thursday at st paul's cathedral where 6000 poor children uh, poor orphan children from various charity schools of london where they study uh, are brought in to participate in it the innocent children who are uh, colorfully dressed are taken to uh, this cathedral to extend their services by singing hymns and religious songs the poem records the actual event that blake himself had witnessed now let us begin with the poem so the first stanza goes as it was on a holy thursday their innocent faces clean the children walking two and two in red and blue and green gray headed beadles walked before with wands as white as snow till into the high dome of paul's they like thames waters flow the speaker gives the reader a word picture of children of the charity schools of london and as i have already told you that they were 6000 in number they have innocent and clean faces and are walking in the double file wearing their dresses in different colors of red blue and green so we can see that blake uses here the words innocent and clean to show purity which was a direct implication to divinity they are walking to participate in the special prayer at st paul's cathedral on the occasion of holy thursday so these children are being led by the gray beadled gray headed beadles with wands as white as snow beadles are the parish officials who serve the ceremonies so they are uh, the grey headed people or the elderly officials with the uh, with the ceremonial white wands in their hands who uh, they are leading these children uh, into the uh, the 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 st paul's cathedral their wands look as white as snow these children in double file they enter the high dome of uh, the cathedral like the flowing waters of the river thames so the flow of the children in long lines has been compared very aptly and effectively to the flow of the waters of uh, thames river which is uh, considered to be a sacred a very sacred river in england blake has used the visual imagery in in form of uh, in form of uh, word images and figures of speech like simile very effectively here in the opinion of the poet this comparison means that the lives of 
the children must also be the same very flowy like the uh, the waters of the river thames here the visual imagery of the symmetry of children entering into the cathedral the grandeur of the palace sorry the place uh, the the colorful attires of children white wands and gray heads of the old guardians makes the whole picture look quite effective and quite vibrant here so the second stanza goes as oh what a multitude they seemed those flowers of london town seated in companies they sit with radiance all their own the hum of multitudes was there but multitudes of lamps thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands so in the second stanza the speaker speaks of these multitudes of children with a rhetoric tone and he describes them as flowers of london town this metaphor is suggestive of a uh, lightning of children and their characteristics with with those of the flowers suddenly the sense of visuals is accompanied by the sense of smell freshness and also of purity so here he has he has uh, compared them with flowers those children who are basically orphan yet are not to be pitied because of their misery contrarily they are described as the flowers that means the essence of the town london the next line describes the children inside the saint paul's in close company with radiance all their own the innocence of the first stanza and the clean appearance here becomes radiance which implies the prolifer proliferation of the former the next speaker talks about the hum of multitudes when those innocent clean and radiant children start speaking their their prayers this hum of their prayers provokes our auditory senses and the speaker takes the visual into these multitudes by calling them uh, lamps this very connection of the children with lamps establishes the religious tone of the poem because lamb is a biblical symbol for christ and even in one of his own uh, poems titled lamb blake has described lamb as christ if we look back at the first stanza so we can see that the large number of the children marching towards the uh, the cathedral also uh, also appear like a herd of lambs and the beadles the gray headed beadles leading them to the cathedral are like the shepherds to them who are herding these innocent uh, souls lamb like souls so there is a parallel between these children and christ who are nothing but the symbol of purity and innocence again in the last line of the second stanza these thousands of little boys and girls have been depicted as raising their their innocent hands in prayer so this scene 
gives us a feeling and suggestion of the religious uh, devotion and uh, resigned spirits of the children when their innocent minds and hands are raising in god's worship now begins the third stanza which goes as now like a mighty wind they raise to heaven the voice of song or like harmonious thunderings the seats of heaven among beneath them sit the aged men wise guardians of the poor then cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door so in the last stanza the humming of the innocent lamps which begins as a soft prayer in the last stanza that is stanza number 2 now in this stanza becomes a mighty wind which rises to heaven and the song of the children becomes so powerful in the next line that the speaker compares it to the harmonious thunderings which directly have their appeal to the seats of heaven the whole couplet explicitly states that the voice of children is the most humble pure and polite yet the most forceful tool to appeal god since the innocence of children is the nearest way to reach divinity the poem further describes the aged men as the wise guardians of the poor children sitting beneath the children the poor children are poor only in the worldly terms whereas sitting here under the dome of st paul's cathedral with their raised hands and strong prayers they represent the divine power itself the poem concludes with an appeal from the speaker to keep all this description and suggestions in the mind and cherish uh, who cherish the pity since the feeling of pathos and pity are the indicators of compassion which is the essence of christian charity but the speaker also appeals to value any poor or helpless child or a person who might knock at any door and be careful lest you drive an angel away from the door this appeal is suggestive of universal human sufferings and the values that help humanity survive so at the end we can say uh, as a conclusion that the poet concludes the poem with a moral message in it the poor orphan children are considered as pitiable by the society they are always marginalized but here the poet reminds everyone that they are parallel to god when he establishes uh, the parallel of god between god and these children with the symbol of lamb and their voices can reach to heaven therefore the wise men of the society should look within their conscience and reconsider the way they behave and treat the poor and downtrodden children who are pure and innocent like christ like lamb so the holy thursday is holy only 
when such children are treated properly otherwise such acts of service to god are of no use so this was the moral message of the poem now let us discuss the structure of the poem the poem consists of three stanzas each stanza contains four lines of two rhyming couplets that rhyme as a a b b the visual and auditory images and the symbolism we have already discussed uh, in it besides them the poem has several similes uh, like a uh, wants as white as snow which also has alliteration in it then uh, like themes uh, waters flow like a mighty wind like harmonious thunderings and uh, other uh, other devices like metaphors also have been used so one metaphor is that of flowers of london than multitudes of lamps so with this here we put an end to the discussion of the poem holy thursday and now let us move on to the next poem that is london of the lecture we will now deal with the poem london by blake the poem london is one of the intensely expressive compositions of the poet in the collection songs of experience published in 1794 blake composed this collection and segmented the poems of serious thoughts worldly Uh, experiences and the reactions of a genuinely human soul to uh, to these experiences in this and as we have uh, discussed already that contrary to this collection the other collection songs of innocence printed before this has uh, the compositions on happy thoughts love harmony and uh, peace and the other themes like these so what we see in this poem the poem london depicts and makes suggestions about the city london in its the then form when it was uh, facing the socio economic and socio cultural and also socio political impacts of uh, the industrial revolution the social fabric as the soul of the poet observes was catastrophically damaged blake as an insider gives us the word images which are disturbing at times and are suggestive of the dire stage of the process of change which had crept in as a by product of the bigger change that was industrial revolution or the industrialization the journey of mankind aims at creating a peaceful society working in harmony to live with and for happiness and a general well-being and welfare but here what happens blake here in london in the poem poem london tells us that the society has failed and has fallen victim to its own creation 
society as a construct of a human developmental process has failed to serve its purpose for which it was created. So this we see in the poem and now let us begin with the text. The first stanza reads as I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. So Blake here in the first stanza plainly sets the tone of the poem which is essentially replete with gloom and melancholy. He portrays here the pathetic and saddening condition of the city London. He takes up the idea of wandering in the, in the chartered streets of the city, in the vicinity of chartered flow of the river Thames. So Thames is uh, the longest river in England and uh, also has the cultural significance and uh, here the poet has used the word chartered for both the streets and uh, the river. So what chartered means? Chartered means uh, charted or mapped. And it also means as a metropolis, the city of London was mapped with certain formalization very systematically uh, that entails um, such formalization that entails certain rules and regulations which are rigid and the people have to abide by them. Blake here implies urbanization with the rigidity of order that curtails the freedom of people of the city. It also implies the political possession of the city that depresses people. So the city, the, the streets are properly charted out and at the same time the river Thames also seems to be affected by that order of charting and looks charted as we know that the uh, the basic nature of the river is to flow freely but here Blake calls it chartered which means it was restrained it was constrained thus amidst uh, the socio-political situation of England the overall condition of the city looks miserable during his walk, wherever the poet goes and whoever he comes across, he finds the marks of weakness and woe, that is sorrow, on the faces of uh, those individuals. So the unhappy faces, devoid of free and joyful life, he looks everywhere. This stanza dwells much upon uh, the word chartered which suggests the domineered state of the contemporary London society. Then he goes on to say uh, in uh, stanza number two, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. Here, uh, Blake develops the idea and tone into various arenas of socio-political periphery. This also incorporates and dwells upon uh, the psychological uh, aspects. The observant sensitivity of the poet notices the cry of every man and infant and uh, observes the innate fear in those cries. He observes the pain of the 
the individuals who range from a grown up man to a new born baby the disheartening state of the city has affected everyone in every situation where some ban has been imposed the society has to restrict its activities this is the socio political scenario of the last decade of the 18th century uh where in london blake finds that besides these external controls and restrictions of bans people have manacles which are mind forced so manacles are the shackles uh, that restrain uh, or uh, the or they can find people but here they are mind forced that is mind born or uh, generated by the mind thus here blake says that the bans that imposed in the city restrain the masses uh, psychologically too and these mental chains are worse than the physical ones he is suggesting that the society in its journey to the objective of general human welfare has lost the basic elemental uh, harmony and the social fabric is now deconstructed uh, destructured the use of the word like chartered ban manacle they all reflect the psychological barriers or the impediments or mental captivity all these things uh, are restraining people confining people and taking away their freedom the next stanza that is stanza number 3 reads as how the chimney sweepers cry every blackening church appals and the hapless soldiers sigh runs in blood down palace walls here in this stanza blake now talks about the segments of society so first beginning with the uh, with the ch- chimney sweepers he says uh, so chimney sweepers what uh, or who they were this was one of the most low profile jobs and segments in london then during the industrial revolution chimney sweepers were in uh, demand very much in demand though it was a very modest job still the impoverished children finding no other means to provide themselves uh, were ready to do these jobs and some were brutally forced into this task and since chimneys uh, used to have such a narrow passage so only the small children could enter them and Uh, this is why chimney sweepers were mostly uh, the orphaned young children uh, young boys and blake links them to the authority of the church since uh, all the orphan children were the responsibility of the church then so blake describes the painful cry of the chimney sweepers uh and uh, he describes the church as blackening here the word blackening has uh two implications and two possible interpretations the first is that the walls of the church are black with the soot and smoke coming out of out of the chimneys which was uh which was a common cause Uh, during those times of industrial revolution and another implication or another suggestion is that since the church authorities 
were also somewhere responsible for such condition of these chimney sweepers, these children who are orphaned. So here the metaphorical darkness of church is shown in this line. To simplify, it implicates the word as a, uh, as a causative verb producing the impact of blackness in form of the soot collected uh, in chimneys and at the same time in its adjectival sense as I already said depicts the negative role of uh, the church about the chimney sweepers. So critics also consider this usage suggestive of the immoral and corrupt practices of the church officials. Though the church is appalled with all uh, this. So appalled means disgusted. Uh, the church is aghast and appalled with the cries of the chimney sweepers, uh, the chimney sweeper young children. And secondly, Blake takes up uh, the sigh of the hapless or unlucky soldiers fighting for the cause of the imperial regime and their blood is seen along with uh, their cries flowing down the palace walls indicating that their sacrifice remained uncared for and neglected. So in a way Blake highlights here the reality of the society and the rift between the powerful and the powerless. Uh, here the chimney sweepers and the soldiers are the part of the uh, the innocent masses <coughs> who work for and uh, who work for and therefore should be cared by the church and the monarchy who entertain all the powers of the state but still negligent of everything. So this stanza depicts the socio-political condition of uh, London of those times. Moving on to the last stanza, Blake says, But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, <coughs> blasts the newborn infant's tears and blights with plagues the marriage hers. So here in the last stanza, Blake takes up another segment of society and it has been done most poignantly. Here he talks about the condition of the young women who are into prostitution. And certainly this shows the moral degradation of this society where the women are forced to become harlots. Blake mentions uh, their curses, blasting the newborn infants tears. The young women are shouting at the newborns and cursing them. This sufficiently unveils the social deterioration. This picture is multifaceted and gives us various impressions of the, uh, of the society where displacement of anger and frustration is seen. The youthful harlots uh, while so doing blights with plagues the marriage hers. Blights means diseases and hers is uh, the carriage which uh, takes the coffins uh, carrying the corpse uh, to church. 
so here with this line uh, blake tries to say that marriage which is essentially an institution for humans to live and uh, grow in sociable uh, forms has no meaning for these young women <clears throat> moreover these young women uh, they infect the men with plague a disease which turns their marriage and life into a hearse so here he uses the oxymoronic phrase marriage hearse uh, quite effectively <clears throat> to signify how it gets diminished and damaged thus here we see this whole situation disheartens the poet to sum up the poem we we find that blake has portrayed the city london very realistically it was the 18th century london <coughs> which was uh which was completely under the impact of industrialization and urbanization the dark gloomy smog filled city was developing <clears throat> developing economically but there was no happiness and joy in the people inhabiting it they looked weak and distressed industrialization urbanization and modernization <clears throat> took away all the innocence that could have been there on the faces or would be there earlier the poem as a piece from the collection songs of experience uh very aptly exemplifies how innocence was waning out in the society the poet throughout the poem emphasizes on what he hears and what uh, and all he hears are the cries the cries of the chimney sweepers and uh, most of the harlots and the infants besides these cries there are sighs of soldiers curses of the harlots tears of young uh, and newborn babies uh, infants so social institutions and political establishments all seem to have failed the church the nobility or monarchy marriage and family all seem to have lost their meanings the constrained life of people and their shackles shackled minds all are depicted by blake here <clears throat> so we can see here that london was developing at the uh, at the time but that development was at the cost of happiness and innocence of the masses depleting social and moral values and loss of innocence in general probably were the reasons why there was an intense desire to return to nature that was felt at that time throughout this poem blake showed the mirror to the society there and intensifies the need of change the poem has four quatrains each stanza rhyming as ab ab blake has used several poetic devices here uh, or the figures of speech here throughout the poem we can observe that there are several words that have been repeated especially in the first and the second stanzas every is the word which has been used in both these stanzas but in the second stanza it has been used as anaphora 
so what is an anaphora it is uh, the repetition of the words or phrases in the beginning of the successive lines the repetition is used to emphasize the idea or to show the urgency of thought so uh, also marks of weakness marks of woe show the uh, marks of woe and uh, mind forged manacles uh, they all show the use of alliteration with the repetition of sounds and uh, blake also makes use of metaphors here metaphor of mind forged manacles and blackening church and also the use of synecdoche uh, which can be seen when blake uses the word palace to signify king or nobility the visual and auditory elements have already been discussed in the poem uh the cries the sighs throughout uh, throughout the poem come as a uh, as a strong imagery so overall the poetic devices used by blake make this poem even more powerful and effective so it was all about the poem i hope it was easy to understand thank you for uh, watching it and for your patient listening we will discuss the other two poems of this unit in the next lecture